Welcome to the Strategy and Leadership Podcast brought to you by SME Strategy. My name is Anthony Taylor and I'm going to be your host today. On the Strategy and Leadership Podcast, we interview senior leaders and thought leaders to get their best practices for leading teams, for driving and executing strategy, and other best practices as it relates to leadership and team development. And our goal here on the Strategy and Leadership Podcast is to bring you practical and executable tips that you can use right away to support the growth of your organization or your business. So if you enjoy today's episode, please be sure to subscribe. You can follow us on YouTube for other bonus content on strategy and leadership, or, and you can join in on the conversation on Facebook in the Strategy and Leadership community. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. So my guest today is Jeffrey Kane. He is the author of Samsung Rising. He's also a former correspondent for The Economist, a former writer for Fast Company, and runs a consulting firm called Inacaterra that does geopolitical forecasting. Jeffrey, how are you today? Thanks for having me, Anthony. I'm good. I'm stoked to get your perspective. I'm stoked to hear about your background and, and to have you share with our listeners, you know, your perspectives on the world, obviously, given this sort of uncertain time. Can you fill in any other blanks about your resume so people get a sense of, of who you are and what's brought you to where you are right now? Sure. So I'm a writer. Uh, I was a former foreign correspondent and I'm a consultant. I'm a business advisor. I advise financial firms mostly on some of the major geopolitical and political movements around the world. So, for example, with coronavirus right now, I'd be speaking with, um, you know, maybe somebody who's involved in the finance industry who's concerned about, say, uh, market volatility in China and, you know, are, are we getting good information on what's happening in China, which is a very opaque and authoritarian environment. So I, I help them uh, navigate some of those risks and con- complexities and, and bring my country, my overseas expertise to kind of show them what is probably happening in some of these markets that might not be getting published elsewhere. Hmm. Very cool. And, and um, uh, you know, in terms of like your history, like obviously writing, corresponding and seeing all of that stuff, maybe you can provide our listeners with like, just like a little bit of insight. What are some of the things that maybe you've seen without giving away any sort of secrets, but what are some of the things you see as a writer and a correspondent that, you know, the general public might not get a perspective on, and then we can sort of segue into your, into your book. So one of the things that we do is um, we, we try to forecast what the world will look like five to 10 years out. And uh, I think one of our major predictions, and this is something that I think more and more people are realizing is that, you know, we are on the cusp of some pretty serious uh, revolutions industrial revolutions that, you know, uh, technological revolutions that would be derived from artificial intelligence. Uh, And a lot of the work that we do is in China right now, which is one of the leaders in the AI field. So we're actually predicting that the world five to 10 years out is going to be vastly different than what we're used to today. But we think that the speed of, uh, you know, surveillance technologies and authoritarianism, so, so, you know, forms of social control um, are really what's going to define a lot of the next decade in terms of technological developments. And there are uses for this kind of technology because it can be used to fight fight crime and to catch criminals. Um, But we are concerned about, you know, forms of of surveillance and social control and, you know, for, from what we do, uh, how that's going to impact, you know, maybe businesses. So small, medium enterprises that are involved in some of these markets. I mean, we think that the risks are going to be growing because governments are simply going to have more power over them all over the world. I mean, in America in China and in Turkey, wherever they're doing business, they're simply going to be at the whim of some of these authoritarian leaders. So we think that the risks of doing business are growing. um, And, you know, some of the complexities too are really starting to, I guess, shake the foundations of what these companies thought the world was going to be like. I mean, 20 years, nobody really thought the world was going to look like this before the iPhone, before social media. I think that a lot of businesses have been caught off guard. And and that's one of the things that we do is try to kind of shine a light on what's going on around the world and and show them, uh, you know, how that's going to impact their own operations. Because I think, you know, definitely as a, as a leader, senior leader, you know, being reactive is one of the challenges. But then, you know, if you don't have the resources at your disposal to be able to, like, predict the future, you know, how do you manage that successfully? And then also, you know, touching on your book is like, how do you manage that in a highly competitive environment where some people are actually racing to be able to move forward? So it's both like racing 
like the the trends that are happening around you to like try to do your best to stay on top of it and then challenging competitors depending on how you're dealing with it and then also like as a human being how do you create success in this in this new world yeah i don't even know where to go from that because it's such a complex topic the part of me wants to ask you you know how do how can businesses do that or what have you seen in businesses and to be able to mitigate the risk or better understand where the world is going so I think that the the biggest challenge that a lot of uh, businesses run into um, is that they're steeped in the world of analytics right now. You know, in the past decade, um, there's been this explosion of big data and you know data that could be mined on social media, but that really only helps in market environments where um, the system is fundamentally democratic and and wealthy, you know, prosperous people can afford, you know, a nice smartphone, they can, you know, they, they're happy to put their information on social media. But I think that uh, the biggest challenge we face is that they enter a market, like, say, it could be somewhere far off, like, you know, Mongolia, and they're kind of expecting a similar situation where they can tap into the data, and they can see what people are doing, and they can kind of run their uh, business based on all this big data that's coming in. But that's not always the case. I mean, the, the fact is that, you know, these are places where, you um, you know, the, the government doesn't have to disclose information and, you know, other companies, uh, suppliers, competitors, they, they, they don't have to tell you what's going on. There are different transparency laws. So the, the opaqueness is one big thing. The other thing that I think faces a lot of businesses now is, you know, this tendency, you know, using analytics and big data to, to look backwards. You know, it's almost as if um, the business world, for the most part, with, with you know, with the exception of, of some very top-notch innovators, they, they tend to uh, walk backwards facing the past, facing what's already happened. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes they get caught in this trap of, I guess, in, in the MBA world, you would call it complacency. The complacency of, you know, what happened in the past is going to keep happening in the future. There's going to be a pattern. And, and what got us here, what, what got us to this level, to this success, is also what's going to propel us to the next big success. We just have to keep you know, honing the, the existing model that we've been using and the existing strategy. You know, it's often very challenging to convince business leaders that, you know, maybe they need to change parts of their strategy in anticipation of something that hasn't happened yet because it is very risky. Um, but we, we do try to bring forward, you know, through a mixture of quantitative and qualitative data. Um, you know, we do our own data gathering on the ground. We interview a lot of people. We talk to a lot of experts and, you know, just trying to give them a sense of how, for example, AI is going to disrupt their manufacturing operations, uh, maybe in as little as five years. I mean, this this could not be that far away. We are making huge advances in AI, you know, for business purposes. Um, so, you know, spatial, they call it spatial AI, that it can kind of see its surroundings. This would power, you know, uh, self-driving uh, automated cars and, and all that kind of thing. And, you know, this would, for example, cause uh, the, the shuttering of say, you know, if you have a big factory investments manufacturing in Turkey, uh, it would make more sense to shut those down and to move them back to wherever you're selling the product. So, you know, if you have consumers in Chicago, uh, it would be better if they can just go on Amazon, order it, and then the AI system will, you know, manufacture uh, enough parts for those orders and send them out sort of as it comes. I mean, it would be a, a much more efficient process. So, but that's really going to change uh, a lot because, I mean, that's going to d disrupt uh, you know, workers, laborers, blue collar jobs, I mean, not just from a business perspective, but politically, that is a major change that could lead to uh, huge upheavals in, in the way business is done and, and some of the risks of, you know, what it means to be doing business in a sector that's really heavily reliant on manufacturing. So like we've seen, you know, recently, where the, the forced implementation of technology where you know everybody's had to work remotely and embrace zoom and, and overnight businesses have had to adapt to this change do you see that same sort of technological integration uh, with this type of artificial intelligence and machine learning and all of that or do you see it like following like typical sort of adoption curves that we've seen in the past or do you see something like a like a hybrid or even you know more resistance to it given the the already increasing speed of change how do you see us adopting this technology within organizations so that's a good question you know i i think that um there for well first of all there is a possibility that all three scenarios you happen could actually uh that, that you just said could actually happen i'd say that i tend to be uh, more on the side that uh the, the Luddites, so the people who try to cling to the old technologies and the old ways, I think that throughout history they've 
tended to be wrong um, in that they it, it's very difficult to resist uh, you know this kind of technological change. Um, so one of the things about you know artificial intelligence and a lot of these new technologies is that they're so they're different from past industrial revolutions in that they really concentrate economic wealth and economic power in the hands of a few. If you can control the intellectual property over one really top-notch AI program and then license it out to basically every company uh, in the Western world that you know needs to do some kind of maybe self-driving delivery service or you know Uber Eats with a AI-powered car uh, or you know manufacturing you know getting getting rid of your workers and just manufacturing based on AI or you know having one worker whose job is to oversee the AI or say you know this could even extend to medicine you know replacing all the radiologists in a hospital with an AI system that can immediately you know learn from all these zillions of correlations and you know and find uh, diseases that humans probably wouldn't catch you know even expertly trained human eyes and I, I think that there's a lot of optimism right now that you know AI will supplement uh, the it'll supplement sort of the, I guess, the human talent that already exists out there. But um, I'm not so optimistic that that's going to happen. I mean, I think it's going to be a much more wide ranging disruption once the technology gets good enough. There might be efforts to unionize or to try to resist through some kind of, you know, organization of of, uh, blue collar, white collar workers. But ultimately, I think that a lot of people are going to have to kind of uh, re-educate themselves. And and I guess you could say rebrand themselves as people who are in fields that AI won't really be able to duplicate. So one example of that would be like, uh, so in any field that involves a lot of emotional intelligence and emotional labor or creativity, things that you know, a computer can't really do. So for example, um, you know, I, I think that the average newspaper reporter might have to change and become a creative fiction writer or, or a novelist of some kind doing some kind of creative work that a computer can't do. Or say, you know, if you're a doctor, um, a lot of the doctors who will be protected will be the the front facing ones, the one who actually deal with the patients. So general family practitioners, you know, the local doctor at the local clinic. Ironically, they'll probably be better protected than a lot of high powered specialists in a field like radiology, which you know I, I don't think is going to have much of a future beyond twenty thirty or so. So if I hear what you're saying, like people who have the, I mean, one is if you look at it from a competitive standpoint and like an economic moat that you want to build your own economic moat as a, either a business or an individual such that you won't be replaced by the technology, even if it's, you know, 10 years down the road. But then the other thing that I'm hearing is that people who are already in those fields and have a set of expertise can start looking at being technologically enabled and like a value add through technology versus being fully like replaceable. So it's a small pivot, but I think it's, you know, in terms of where the sector is going to be going, something that needs to be done over the, and I, from what I hear you say over the next 10 years or so from 2020 to 2030. Yes. Yes. And uh, this is not all going to be bad. I mean, there will be some kind of disruption and there will be the displacement of people. But um, I think that I guess the average structure of a business, a small medium business um, will look a lot different in the year 2030 or 2040 or somewhere down the road. Um, so, for example, let's say if you run a uh, interior design and painting, you know, company, and it's you know it's a one-two person firm, um, you know. Th- this, so, what's this? What this is going to do is AI is going to free up um, a lot of the manual labor and a lot of sort of the more logical, rational processes. You know, the the, the accounting books and the you know, sort of the day-to-day operations, the numbers, the uh, the actual business side, it's going to free up human hands and human minds. And uh, instead, what you're going to be able to do is say you're an interior designer, um, you go to somebody's house, you're going to be able to, I guess, visualize a concept or, um, you know, have an idea in your head, and then you're going to be able to run it through an artificial intelligence program or an app somewhere, maybe on your smartphone. And, you know, based on what you're telling the computer, it'll think of just a, a myriad of different options that you know you can choose from and you know a lot of these will be highly original they're not going to be replicated it's not like you're just pulling out a template from a software system and applying it to houses i mean i think that over time um these systems are going to get very very sophisticated because they can learn based on what they've already been doing and they can learn in ways that even you know the the developers of ai still don't understand how exactly they learn and you know i i think that that's a very powerful thing i mean that that also has the potential to uh, put enormous, I, I guess, just you know, economic and business value in the hands of small entrepreneurs, as long you know, assuming they can get access to 
some kind of licensing or some kind of software that's not going to be, you know, in the uh, in the hands of, I guess, you know, one giant powerful elite corporation that controls everything. So yeah, I mean, there are a lot of a lot of problems that are going to arise, a lot of opportunities, and it really comes down to how in the next 10, 15 years we manage some of these changes. And you know, as long as we don't allow them to simply, you know, disrupt the industry too fast to come in and just replace everybody. Um, I, I mean, I think that will probably be okay. And I think that a lot of people will be able to find new jobs in different areas that are not manual labor. So really looking. So from what I hear in terms of like, if you're running a business that to like keep it on your periphery of these type of technologies and, and seeing, you know, slowly, I don't know, making slow integration. I don't know if that's what you're advising because obviously the field is you can going to go in leaps and bounds probably over the coming years, but slowly looking at incorporating it to see how you can, you know, build it as part of your supply chain because it's coming, but you know, you don't want to be too ahead of the curve. Would you say that there's maybe a, a risk in being too ahead of the curve or what are your thoughts on that? Jeffrey? Oh, yes, there is a risk. And I think that's a risk that in a lot of different technological fields that businesses run up to that, you know, there sometimes if you're too much of an innovator, it's easy to overinvest or, you know, over uh, hilt yourself in some new big promise technology that really turns out uh, to be nothing in the end, that, that turns out to be a dud. Um, so, I mean, maybe one example of this might be the famous, the good old dot-com boom of 2001. Uh, you know, th there was a glut of companies that were trying to do dot-com. You know, these are low barrier to entry firms where basically anybody with enough capital, and it wasn't hard to get capital at the time, uh, you know, could open a website and sell things across the nation. It, so in, in economic theory, the dot-com era of the late 90s was the, really the first time when a single business could have unlimited demand uh, across America, North America, or worldwide even. Now, of course, that low barrier to entry meant that a lot of firms came in and a lot of them ended up collapsing. And one of the reasons they collapsed is because a lot of them were over-invested in future technologies that were either a bit too early or a bit too far off in terms of their actual applicability to the market. And I could actually think of quite a few. So, um, I actually, you know, spoke to a, couple, a pair of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley just a couple of years ago. They were telling me their story and, and how one of the biggest things that they learned, you know, was the importance of timing with the market when it comes to embracing a new technology. So they had released a very early, you know, cell phone GPS system, like back in the late 90s, back when this dot-com boom was having. And yeah, GPS worked. I mean, GPS was a technology that was starting to make inroads and that I think a lot of people saw that in the future it would be widely adopted on people's phones or on their, you know, on whatever it was they were using on their computers. You know, they could use it in their cars. The problem was that, you know, cell phone hardware technology just hadn't really developed fast enough to keep up with, you know, what was going on and some of the advances in GPS software. The, you know, the software itself was fine, um, but a cell phone screen was too small. The connection was too slow you know, it would be a delayed connection and you, you know, you'd be like waiting 10 seconds after your right turn for the GPS to tell you that it's going to give you a right turn. I mean, you know, I think that a lot of people who use GPS back in the day remember th these kinds of problems. Um, and anyway, so these two entrepreneurs and, you know, they are very successful. They did make a very good living doing a lot of these startups, but they, they kept telling me that, you know, each time they would come out with one of these big ideas, you know, they thought that they were being smart because they were so ahead of the market but then it just the capabilities out there were not good enough to bring it to the market. So in the end, they couldn't sustain the business long enough uh, until it became marketable. And, you know, they would usually have to have some exit strategy, like maybe they would get acquired by uh, a big company like Sprint or something that needed a, a GPS system that it could own for its phones. Um, so, you know, I think that this is also something that faces a lot of entrepreneurs today, that there is this question of technological disruption that's coming in the next decade. And this disruption is probably going to be bigger than the past decade of disruptions. And the question is, nobody really knows exactly, you know, when the biggest changes are going to happen. But the only thing they can do is to start taking these incremental steps. So there's an actual system in place, you know, of some kind. So, you know, when the big AI advances come, and that could be about five years from now, maybe 10 years at the latest, they have something ready, like they know what they're getting into, and they know how to get started and how to use this technology. Because I see a, a sort of a mix between, you know, the up and coming technologies that are putting those like big bets. And then my, my sort of approach to business is like solve an existing need and like grow slow 
because we've seen a lot of those businesses that have like grown, gotten huge valuations, and then, you know, now are just in, they don't have any like sort of financial su- sustainability. And then there's the, those, you know, the diamonds in the rough that really solve something crazy and, and, and were really successful. So I think, again, you know, hedging, balancing both of those things to meet a need now, being ready for the needs in the future and not going be being too on the cutting edge because otherwise, you know, on the one hand you get all the arrows in the back, but the odds of you being, you know, that much more successful, is going to be lower. Um, just as we sort of finish up here, can you tell us a little bit about the book and, you know, what inspired you to, to write it and, and what can our uh, listeners hope to get from it in terms of a reading experience? Sure, Anthony. So my book is called Samsung Rising, the inside story of the South Korean giant that set out to beat Apple and conquer tech. Um, So it's based on many, many years of research and reporting from my time uh, at Time Magazine and the Fast Company and The Economist when I was was covering the Apple-Samsung wars for a while back in the day. So um, just to remind listeners, in uh, 2010 and 2011, Steve Jobs was extremely angry at Samsung for daring to launch a phone that was a lookalike phone that would compete with his, uh, you know, his relatively new iPhone. This led to uh, one of the longest running business battles in recent history and one of the costliest and also the longest uh, patent infringement lawsuit ever um, in uh, in American history. So, you know, this was a very serious, the Apple versus Samsung was, you know, one of the major battles that really just, I I, I would say, shaped uh, a lot of the technology that we've used over the past decade and you know, sort of the uh, the smartphones and the, the way that they look and the way that, that we use them, the way that we use them for social media and uh, content and streaming and, you know, getting our news and all this kind of thing. So I actually, I started writing the book in, in 2010 when I was going out there to report. And I found it fascinating because I had been at Apple and I had been, you know, covering Facebook. I had been at Silicon Valley, uh, you know, covering your usual list of Silicon Valley companies. And we were invited to do some tours of the Samsung headquarters. And what I found fascinating was that there was this major company. I mean, it's the biggest technological conglomerate in the world. And yet nobody really seemed to know their story outside of the walls of the Samsung headquarters. I mean, I would ask people, what do you think of Samsung? And they'd be like, I don't know, is that some Japanese company or some Asian company? And, you know, it's actually South Korean. Um, And what I found fascinating about it was that not only was it secret, but it was just it was totally different from anything I'd seen in Silicon Valley, you know, a major technology company that, uh, you know, I I would go interview their top executives and they would say things like we're working towards the vision of our founder. Our founder wanted to create a new world. He wanted to create a miracle with his technology. And then another guy would say like, you know, our chairman, he gave 300 hours of speeches and it was a glorious moment. I can't believe that he was able to give, 300 hours of speeches, and we are moving into the dream and vision of our chairman. We are implementing his vision. Everywhere I went, there was like this weird uh, cult of personality, a cult of leadership around the Samsung chairman, whose name is Lee Kun Hee. And as I got deeper, um, I found that Samsung's different, uh, not just because of this, but because it's essentially a feudal dynasty. Uh, It's a three-generation dynasty uh, that runs this technological empire as if it's some kind of almost like a a Game of Thrones style, you know, or Succession. I'm I'm sure you've seen HBO Succession. It's like, it's one of these stories about this family soap opera and this dynasty wanted to build the nation of Korea by building the company of Samsung. And as they set out, they wanted to install their heirs to this Samsung throne to make Samsung the biggest company in Korea and in the world. And uh, this led to major scandals. So there was shareholder warfare. Um, There were major corruption scandals, bribery, uh, the... Uh, the current vice chairman of Samsung, who is the heir to this empire, uh, was in and out of jail for a year. He was accused of bribing the president. Uh, he's now on a final appeal trial, and we'll hear soon what exactly he's going to be you know, found guilty of if he's found guilty. And you know, it's just like, I, as I got deeper, I felt like I was going into this rabbit hole, and it, it just got so fascinating because it would be uh, you know, one scandal after another and you know, one, uh, you know, one world-changing technology after another. I, I just found it so unusual that a dynasty could, you know, kind of be layered on top of this major technological giant and, you know, could actually do battle with Apple and do battle with Sony and succeed at it. That's awesome. Well, it definitely, you definitely painted a very vivid picture. So uh, I'm excited to, I know I've, I've got my, my, been able to take peeks at it. So I'm really looking forward to getting into it more and, uh, 
getting our, our listeners an opportunity to read it. If you like business books and if you like hearing a story, an otherwise untold story, then you'll definitely want to uh, check out this book. Uh, Jeffrey, where can people um, get in touch with you? Where can people uh, get the book or, or learn more about uh, the stuff that you write on or the stuff that you consult on? So, uh, yeah, so I have a website and it's my name, jeffreykane.net, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. C-A-I-N dot net. And that has uh, all my ratings on there. It has uh, a lot of this, you know, global consulting work that I've been doing. Um, so if anybody wants to check that out and read what I've been up to, I'm always posting updates. Uh, the book is available. So the book came out from Currency, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House. And it's available at pretty much every major bookstore. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Penguin's website, uh, Barnes and Noble, local local bookstore. Um, I mean, it's it's on Audible. We actually had a voice actor who was on an episode of Succession, the HBO show. Uh, his name is Michael Brown, and he did the audible narration. It's a, a very, very good narration, and I think that the publisher and I are both very happy with it because he really does bring out that dramatic element of this, you know, this Samsung empire. And I think he knows that because he was on Succession. He knows exactly what the story is about. Um, so, yeah, books available, and uh, I'm actually – based in Istanbul, Turkey now. Um, I'm doing a new project on the future of technology, surveillance, artificial intelligence. It'll probably be out in 2021 in the spring. Um, that's under contract with Public Affairs, which is another publisher. So yeah, um, lots going on. And I'm always you know, happy to speak with uh, readers or uh, you know, anybody who visits my website is, and is interested. They can email me on there. Uh, it's jeff at jeffreykane.net. And I'm always happy to open up a, a thread and have a conversation. Awesome. And uh, again, the book is a really easy read. It read very, uh, you know, some bios are a little bit dry, but this one definitely read like a TV show. So I thought that was really cool. But uh, Jeffrey, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for sharing with us. And I uh, wish you, I uh, wish your books uh, many success over time, but thank you for spending the time with us today. All right. Thank you, Anthony. My guest today is with Jeffrey Kane, who is the author of Samsung Rising. If you know somebody who likes the world of technology trends and where the future is going and really likes a good story around it, be sure to send them today's podcast. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to rate us five stars on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. My name is Anthony Taylor. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. And until next time. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. If you're in the process of renewing your strategic plan and you're looking for a framework to align your team and to create a clear vision, clear goals, and a clear roadmap on how to get there, be sure to check out our signature course that will walk you through the process that we've used to create hundreds of strategic plans successfully for organizations all over the world. You'll get instant access to all the videos and documents right away. And so whether you're planning a strategy session in three months, three weeks, or three days, you'll be able to get the most out of your meeting and have everyone be on the same page and bought into your plan. It's the exact same framework that we've used for our clients and we've packaged it in a way that you can use it easily yourself. So visit smestrategy.net slash course and you can use the code podcast for $100 off. That's smestrategy.net slash course and use the code podcast for $100 off and you'll get instant access to all of the tools to help you create your strategic plan successfully and have everybody moving forward on the same page. Once again, this is Anthony Taylor with the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you real soon.